Okay. You know, I'd rather be doing this. <laughs> All right. So we're going to finish up our uh, our unit on conformal stuff today um, with some really, you know, I, I want to try to bring it to, like, for people maybe that have not been following exactly why we're doing what we're doing, I'm going to try to, like, make it really grounded today. Yep. This homework will be due uh, next week on Monday. Because I just put it up, and I've got actually two more questions to put on it, and we're gonna do a we're gonna have uh, like a work day on Thursday, and then depending on how that goes, we'll um, I might adjust from there, but I don't think so. So we'll see. But yeah, so work day on Thursday, and um, uh, the next section of the class will be about um, we're gonna start by looking at the factorial function and how the factorial function turns into the gamma function. We we'll use that to talk about analytic continuation and the zeta function, and then um, uh, sort of special functions are our next topic in the class. So special functions are really cool, and then we'll get to talk about why the sum of the integers is minus one twelfth. Finally, okay. So um, sort of as our last uh, sort of day here, I want to be really concrete about some examples. Sort of really like nail down what we've been doing uh, to the ideas of to really specific problems. So imagine here that you've got, now we're going to be talking about temperature, right? So specifically, I want you to think about temperature. What sort of quantity is temperature? Scalar, Scalar quantity. And then we're going to have heat flow. So the energy that produces the temperature is like flowing through this thing. So we're going to be thinking specifically about a temperature map on uh, on, on shapes like the circle, for example. So if I gave you a, a disk like this, not just a, I mean, I want you to think of a disk. So it's not just the boundary, it's the stuff inside the disk as well, OK? So it's like a metal circle, thin metal circle. And we take half of the boundary, and we hold it with a constant temperature of 1, and half the boundary, and hold it with a constant temperature of 0 on some scale, whatever that scale happens to be. You can sort of guess what you might think the temperature map of this thing looks like. So if I drew lines in here to represent places where the temperature was constant, we already have two of them. Where does the temperature equal, where should the temperature be one half, do you think? Probably in the line down the middle, right? So it's a good, at least a good guess maybe that you think, OK, I bet because the problem is symmetric, Probably it's the case that t is equal to 1 half is the line that runs down the middle. So lines of constant temperature have a name. For those of you that have taken engineering or thermodynamics have probably seen the term isotherm before. This is one of the, one of the words for this is isotherm. So an isotherm is a line of constant temperature. What are the rest of them look like, you think? So maybe, okay, now that's a good question. Do they run like this, do you think? Or do they run like this? For it? You think they're, they hold on to this line at one at the, at the uh, at i and minus i? Or do you think they slide down the sides? I think they have to hold on to the minus one side. OK, why? It's because of the only possible spot where they can be different because you're holding the boundary constantly equal to 0 and the boundary constantly equal to 1. So the only place where you can transi transition these lines from 0 to 1 is going to happen where the boundary transitions from 0 to 1, right? So this is a mathematical artifact. But you should expect what's going to happen here, at least if you think about it for a second, probably you're going to get these arcs that look closer and closer to cr like lining up with the arc of the circle, right? And then over here, maybe you have some lines that look like this. So all of these orange lines, these are the isotherms. If you were looking at the map of the weather, you could, you could write, write this down. Maybe this is the place where t is equal to 9 tenths. And this is the place where t is equal to 4 fifths. And you could actually write down the way that the temperature was uh, uh, graded across the, across the disk. OK, so if those are the isotherms, what should the gradient field look like? So you can actually just draw a couple of arrows to guide you. So the gradient, remember, is perpendicular to these lines. And so you're going to get these things that look like this. Now, of course, I'm drawing the gradient in the backwards direction from the direction that heat actually flows. 
So the gradient basically tells you the derivative, right? So the gradient of t, rad t, is a vector field. I'm writing off my area here. So the gradient of t is a vector field. And it points in the direction of greatest change. Right? So it tells you how, which direction in which the temperature map is changing the most. And geometrically, it's the case that um, these gradient fields turn out to be perpendicular to the level curves of the function they're gradient fields for. <coughs> right? OK, so if you put vector arrows all over the place and then you landed them on these isotherms, they're going to be perpendicular to each other. And remember that the way that heat moves, at least the what we physically <coughs> discover it can be modeled imprecisely mathematically, is that heat flows on the lines that are dictated by the gradient field, the flow lines. And usually, at least uh, the way Marsden and Hoffman talk about it and many other mathematical approaches to this is to call these flux lines. So if you trace out along the gradient, you end up with lines that look like, and you did really different color here, green on green is terrible. Use blue, so whatever, I'll just keep pink. So lines like this tell you something about how the heat energy is. I did some bad job on that one. So we should expect, just from our like sort of guessing about what we know about the geometry of this stuff, that probably it looks like this. And the heat is flowing against the gradient because it runs from high temperature to low, and so if you're actually modeling a physical problem, you have to write down the arrows in the correct direction. Gradient is the direction of greatest positive change. Heat flows backwards to that. These are called flux lines. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, flux is a more general term for like for, for the, this sort of stuff. I mean, every engineering and scientific discipline has their own language to describe it. Even <coughs> the same exact scenario, there's different vocabularies in different uh, in different settings. Okay, so the question is, <clears throat> that's sort of our guess as to what's going on here, just from knowing what we know about the way that like the you know just we're intuitively thinking. Okay, well that seems reasonable to think that if these are being held constant and this is what the level curves of the temperature look like, that that probably is the way that the heat flows. And so now the question that we've been trying to solve in the last uh, couple of weeks has been, uh, can we find the actual mathematical function that describes this, or some mathematical function that tells us what's going on in this, in this picture? And so the idea is, this is the question, is to find the function t. Or more precisely, find a function t. Find a function t describing this picture. Now, because in our intuition we have made the assumption here that the uh, level curves of the temperature map and the gradient field are orthogonal, we're going to want to find a harmonic function, right? Like harmonic, it's not even just that. It's the fact that we know that like harmonic functions describe uh, sort of this kind of idealized temperature flow. So we're going to find a harmonic t. That means we want to find a harmonic t, which means we want the um, this condition to hold. Right. So it needs to satisfy Laplace's equation, and it needs to be the case that uh, t satisfies the boundary conditions. OK, now again, harmonic t, we're using a harmonic function precisely because this is inherited from physical study. Right? It turns out to be the case that harmonic functions do a good job of describing this, so we're going to find a harmonic t. It's not some mathematical magic. It's just Oh, hey, look, these functions all have this property. What's the what, So this is one way of checking a function as harmonic. What's the other way? Um, 
real part, t, if t happened to be the real part of some function f, where f was uh, analytic, that's the other way that you could check that a function is harmonic. So you have two goes with this, right? You can either directly compute the Laplacian and show that it's zero, or you can sh exhibit the fact that t is the real part of some analytic function. Well, either one of those will, will, get, will demonstrate that whatever you write down is harmonic. Now, if we're working in the disk, we have one tool right now, and I really don't want to use it, which is the Poisson integral formula. Right? That's our, that's, that, from this picture, that's our, that's our go. It's like, oh, I'm on a disk, I've got some boundary conditions there are, the, where I've just, okay, is this a Dirichlet Dier, problem or a, a Neumann problem? Dirichlet, because I've given you boundary values and not boundary derivatives, right? So, so I happily run over and I consult my, my textbook or more realistically my computer integration program and maybe I slap down the Poisson integral formula. I'm not going to do it. But... So, we do it this way, and the answer is if only we could find a conformal map of that disk to a more reasonable shape that we could find a harmonic solution on. If only. Because I don't really want to do the Poisson integral formula if I can avoid it. So what's the answer? We're going to take this and we're going to map it to what's the, what's the best what's the best possible outcome of this conformal map? Upper half plane, because I have a standard solution in the upper half plane. So we're going to use this map, and then we're going to try to track and see what happens to that shape. So we write down the map. Um, so if we have a disk. And we want to transform it to an upper half plane. Um, one of the maps that does that is so uh, disk goes to upper half plane with minus i times 1 plus z over 1 minus z. And then we can go back the other direction with w minus i over w plus i. That goes this way. In general, how do you find those? So it's a standard library. Uh, so like this is so this is one of these things where it's unsatisfactory. But really, as the domains that people studied, they figured out which ones were the really useful ones. They developed a standard library of conformal transforms. And so you should just expect those are given to you. Specific ones might show up if you want to map specific points to specific points. But essentially, as is classical in engineering and applied math, and even pure math is if you have something like this, you just have a big ass book that has thousands of these things inside of it, and you flip through and find the one you want and you apply it. Right? So it's enough just to know that this exists, that you can get in and out of disks and upper half planes with conformal maps and then just go find one written down. Okay. I mean, from a practical standpoint, you could determine this by mapping this circle to the, you know, the boundary circle here to the real axis here and actually construct it that way, but it's easier just to consult a standard library. Okay, so I want to find a, uh, I'm going to take these boundary conditions and I'm going to try to map them over into the upper half plane. So the map that I need to use to do that is going to be, I'm going to take my circle, which looks like this, so there's a simpler circle again. And then I'm going to push it over to an upper half plane with the map minus i times 1 plus z over 1 minus z. And we'll come out with an upper half plane. Where does, well, let's just keep track of where everything went. Where does 1 go? There's 1. Infinity. OK. So 1 is out here. Infinity, so infinity is the image of one, and also infinity is going to be out here as the image of one. Where does I go? I should probably just tell you where I goes. I goes to negative one, and minus I goes to positive one, and minus one goes to zero. 
So let's interpret what that means on the boundary here. I went to minus 1. So I is this point. And it got mapped to minus 1. That's the image of I. And minus I went to positive 1. Positive 1, which is the image of minus I. And then do I have another point to track here? Oh, minus 1 went to 0. OK, so this point right here, minus 1 goes here. 0 is the image of minus 1. And that should let us reconstruct where the boundary conditions hold after we push them after it. If you look at the blue portion of the map, the blue portion of the map includes the points i, 0, and minus i. So i, 0, and minus i, the blue portion of the map got mapped to this segment. And the yellow segment, well, the yellow segment goes i, 1, minus i. And so you have to run through infinity. i, 1, minus 1, minus i. And so our disk picture turns into this half plane picture where now we're prescribing the boundary condition. We want u to be equal to 1 on this piece, and u to be equal to 1 on this piece and u to be equal to 0 on this piece in the middle. So it's the same boundary conditions, but pushed through the control map. Yep? If the 0 goes to minus i, do we go to lower half? 0 minus i minus one. What's that? Minus. Yeah, the negative fixes it, I think, and pushes it to upper. OK, so I guess it's worth pointing out that this goes here. Now, the reason that we developed the standard half-plane solution now is because I can just write down the equation that describes this in the upper half-plane. I think I'm right here. zero minus i So zero, but hold on, did I write something down wrong? Minus i, one plus c over one minus c, zero. Yeah, you do, don't you? I mean, it doesn't matter because the solution in the lower half plane is going to be, you can do it in the lower half plane just to fly away. Do you just No, because that flips the orient. I guess it's symmetric, right? So yeah, that's probably just a typo in my notes. I want, the, I just, I want to use the upper half plane model because that's our standard model. So whatever. Man, I spent so much time looking at these things. <laughs> OK. Yeah, that's OK. Whatever. All right, so what does the standard map say to do? The standard map says that we're supposed to write this down. We're supposed to take point Z, which is x plus iy, and we're supposed to calculate a theta uh, 2 and a theta 1. And then from those two angles, we reconstruct a function that is the standard up ha upper half plane solution. right? And so I'm just going to write down what the solution is in terms of these angles. So because we're working over here, I'm actually going to not use z. I'm going to use w here because I'm working in the transformed domain. So I'll use w's for the transformed domain and z's for the original domain, just like I did in the maps here. Okay. So the solution should be u of w is equal to 1 minus 1 over pi theta 2 plus 1 over pi theta 1. And that comes just from writing down the standard solution that we did last time with the coefficients that represent the temperature at the boundary. So this is the upper half plane standard solution. If you like, it's what are there? Three regions this time, so C2 minus C1 minus C2 over pi theta 2 plus C0 minus C1 over pi theta 1. That is the structure of the standard solution. The C's represent the temperatures and the thetas represent the angles. Okay, so that means 
and we showed this last time, this is the real part of an analytic function. So we could write down the function f of w is equal to 1 minus 1 over pi i times the log of w minus 1 plus 1 over pi i times the log of w plus 1. So the observation here is that u is the real part of f. Arguments show up as the imaginary part of logs, so if I divide out by i, I flip the real and imaginary parts. f is analytic. So u is harmonic. You don't actually need to know that because we've already demonstrated that the standard solution is harmonic, but I'm just trying to remind all how all the pieces come together. Okay. Well, now I've got an F on W, right? So F right now, this is our standard solution in the upper half plane. F is the complex potential on H, if I call this set H, or half plane. F is a complex potential on H. How can I turn it into a complex potential on the disk? Just precompose it, right? If I have a map that gets me from the disk to the upper half plane, and then I apply F, <coughs> this sort of like complex potential afterwards, I'll have something that takes inputs from the disk instead. So the idea here is that I want to take the disk, I want to throw it over here to the upper half plane by tracing through with this map, I times 1 plus Z over 1 minus Z. And then once I do that, then I'm going to apply the function f, which is going to get me, um, well, it's, this is the complex potential. So if I pre-compose f with this map, I'm going to get something that takes the disk to a complex potential instead. It will be a complex potential on the disk. And it will be a complex potential on the disk that matches the boundary conditions. Okay, so. The first part of it was the conformal map that transformed what we were interested in into something we already understood. And then once we have it, we're going to use composition to put the pieces together to get us a potential on the domain we're interested in. So if you write the solution down, it looks like this. Um, F, I guess we can call it F hat of Z f hat of z now, because now this is a function defined in the disk. f hat of z is equal to f composed with, I should give that a name, well, f of i times 1 plus z over 1 minus z. So take f and compose that function into it. If you put in a z in the disk, what comes out, this thing that came out was in the upper half plane, and f knows what to do with things in the upper half. And so the solution that we're actually interested in, the temperature map that describes what's happening here, our harmonic function, T should be equal to the real part of F hat. So I'll put that right here. Since I'm just basically running the same function down again, which means that our map that we're interested in T should be equal to the real part of 1 minus 1 over pi i times the log of this madness, uh, i times 1 plus z over 1 minus z minus 1 plus 1 over pi i times the log of i times 1 plus z over 1 minus z uh, plus 1 u. So the point is, you don't have to think this is pretty. You just have to know it exists, and you can compute it. So this is literally our upper, upper half-plane solution with that conformal transform just composed into it. I'm writing out in gory detail. And it turns out that this function, t, is the precise function that recovers the flow lines that we thought were going to happen in this case. If you take this function and you actually map what's going on with the level curves of this, then you end up with uh, 
that for this particular function, that t is equal to c has lines that look like this. So these are the lines corresponding to t is equal to c, where c is some constant. Those are the isotherms. Yep. How do you do this outside? It actually describes what happens on the outside as well. So the flaw lines that you'll get here will, will spray out in, the, in other directions from this. Yeah. So yeah, that's a good question. These maps actually can be used to describe what happens. So you can imagine I've got an infinite piece of metal and I punch a hole out of the middle of it and I set up uh, boundary conditions here. You'll get flow out the, the other way too. Not usually a scenario that you're looking at, but yeah, they, the conformal maps can do in, insides and outsides of objects like this. In fact, if you use Mathematica to visualize this, you will get the flow lines that come out. Okay, so those are the lines where t is equal to c. And then if you let, say, t star be equal to the imaginary part of that function, so f hat, which was f composed with that conformal map, um, these lines, I should have written that pink lines. If you look at the level curves of that, um, then you end up with stuff that looks like this. These are the places where T star is equal to Because remember, the imaginary part of an analytic function is the harmonic conjugate of the real part. So generally, this is how these exercises are going to look. They're not going to be very complicated. Um, it's going to be a simple domain, a simple conformal transform, writing down the standard solution, and then going back. Okay. So this is about as straightforward an example of everything we've been doing for the last week as you can get. Yep. Why is our solution so that we don't have to transform back into the so the way, because remember that what's going on with a harmonic function is harmonic functions are real value, right? So what you should really be thinking here is that there's some graph sitting over the top of this, right? You give me an x and y, and there's a z that dictates what the temperature is. So you can think of a graph here. And we're saying, if I could find the graph, if I could, uh, I can figure out what the graph here should be by picking a value in the domain, sending it here first, and then applying f and whatever real value comes out of that, I used as the height of my graph over here, right? So these really are the domain elements. We're just transforming them in a way so that they're appropriate inputs for this function. Yeah, you do have to pay attention to the direction that you're doing the conformal maps. Okay, so is this okay? Any questions about this? All right, so here's one last, I'm, I sort of like, I want to give you guys a, a weirder example here. I had an example that had something to do with, okay, so I'll, tell, I, I'll ask you this question. We won't work through the whole example. You guys can just tell me how to do it. What if I give you this problem? I say, oh, I have a quarter plane, and I put, that's my yellow shot. <coughs> T is equal to 100 on this line, and T is equal to 0 down here. And I would like to find a harmonic function that describes what's happening in the middle. What conformal transform should I use? I'd square that bad boy, right? Turn a quarter plane into a half plane. So the map here that you would use to make this into the standard solution would be to square. Right? If you square a quarter plane, it unfolds into a half plane. Any guesses as to what the what the flow lines should look like here. We're not going to run the entire example, but you should think. What would the lines of constant temperature look like, you think? Like, like curved circles, of constant temperature? Sorry, that would be just max and temperature. Yeah. Yeah, so it's actually easier to think about what the flux lines should be here. What should the flux lines be? You should think like this, right? It's probably it's going to do something like this. If you guess that's what the flux lines, then that means you've already told me what you think the lines of cut. No. Um, if you told me that that's how you think the temp, the heat is flowing in this problem, that means you're also telling me essentially that you think that the lines of constant temperature should look like this. That this should be T is equal to C. So a lot of times you can sort of 
maybe guess if you're in, you have an intuition about what's happening in a problem like this, and then when you get your solution, you should you should see if it comports with what you've uh, with what you guessed. Anyway, so this is uh, this is another example. I might leave that one for those. There's something very much like this in the in the homework. This is an easy one. I want to do a more interesting one, which is what happens when you can't use the standard solution, and you gotta you gotta guess a little bit more. So we're going to start by looking at a more interesting conformal map than we've seen so far. So I want to talk about what you do when you're faced with something called a half strip. So I put this at i pi, and I have this half strip scenario. Now these things come to practice all the time when you might be doing physical models. And the map that we're going to apply to this, that's a lot of half strip models. The map that we're going to apply is the map e to the z, and we're going to see if we can figure out what the hell e to the z does to that. Alright, there's the pink line, and maybe we'll put a blue line right here. And let's see if we can figure out what the hell's going on. All right, I'm going to start with the easiest possible line. What does e to the z do to this blue line segment right here? You feed it purely imaginary numbers with, uh, you know, it's like 0 up to i pi. What comes out? What's e to the e to the i pi over 3? Oh, it's a unit circle angle, right? How about e to the i pi? What is that? Minus 1. Right? These are just arguments you know, on this line. Everything on here looks like e to the pi theta, where theta runs between 0 and pi. So on this line, everything looks like e to the i theta. Theta runs from 0 to 1. You end up with this. e to the 0 is 1. e to the i pi is minus 1. Everything in between is a unit circle angle. So as you trace that line this way, you go that way on the boundary here. The direction doesn't matter, but it's useful to keep track of what's happening. OK, that's the easy part. What happens, OK, so I put in 0 and I got out 1. So that point right there, that point right there are the same. What happens is I take e to the z and I feed it real numbers tending to minus infinity? Yeah, right? e to the minus 1, e to the minus 2, e to the minus 3, e to the minus 4. And they're real numbers, right? So it really is just e to the minus 3, e to the minus 4. As you trace this way, you're looking at e to the x as x tends to minus infinity, which means you're tending to 0, right? And that means this line segment, this yellow line segment at the bottom, this dude goes here. All right? What about this line up here? So up here, you're looking at numbers that look like uh, x plus i pi, and x tends to minus infinity. So what does e to the z look like in that case? e to the z looks like e to the x times e to the i pi. But e to the i pi is minus 1. So this looks like e to the x times minus 1 and x is tending to negative infinity because you're tracing this way again, right? x is tending to minus infinity. So what does that number approach? It starts at negative 1 and it goes to 0, but through the negative numbers, right? So you go this way. And so you get this weird model where these half strips can be conformally mapped into half disks. Yeah, it's an interior to interior thing. So this interior here maps to this interior here. So half strip models are really useful when you're dealing with problems that have mixed boundary conditions. So if I have pieces of, uh, like, um, say on this circle, this is the question I'm going to pose. What would happen if I had a half disk? So my initial scenario is going to be this. This is the map that we're going to keep in mind for our conformal transform this time. I go this way with e to the z. How do I come back? 
log z. Okay, so challenge, figure out how, why the log z takes that back here. <coughs> this is easier to understand in the e to the z direction. If you started with this set and fed it the boundary in terms of log z, then go ahead and figure out why this through log turns back into this, other than just the fact it's the inverse and so therefore it must. So if I gave you a condition uh, that looked like this, so this is a sort of simple but more complicated type of problem called a mixed boundary value problem. Suppose I told you I had the following scenario. I have an insulated half circle and then two different conditions at the boundary. So here we have, um, uh, what are we going to impose? T is equal to zero on this side. And then that was pink. T is equal to one over here. And then the additional condition that at this piece of the boundary, I insist that dt dn is equal to zero. So it's a mixture of Dirichlet conditions where I've assigned a value at the boundary and Neumann conditions where I told you temperature cannot escape through the circle. Remember, this is temperature. And so to say that this is insulated is to say temperature is not escaping the system this way. I have these things are being held at constant temperatures and then a boundary where heat can't escape. Find a harmonic T that solves this question. Okay, now, again, any guesses as to what the line should look like here? So first off, what does it mean? What, are the, what is the relationship between flux lines and an insulated boundary? They gotta be parallel, right? Because if they pointed in the direction of the boundary, then that would mean temperature was going out that way. So they have to be parallel. So your first guess should be, well, from low temperature to high temperature means probably the, the line there's a reasonable line that happens there. Any guesses as to what happens in the middle? It's a concentric circle. What do you think? Something like that. It's a reasonable stab, right? Like, at least it was parallel at the boundary. That doesn't mean that they have to stay circles, but maybe they do. So it's a guess. And that was the flow lines I wrote down here, right? That's not the places where constant temperature happens. What are we thinking for constant temperature then? Radial lines again. Funny how once you've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? It's, the, it's kind of the feature of this kind of mathematics. Okay, so let's actually see if we can recover that result. So what we're going to do, this is our guess as to what's happening here. We're going to try to use this conformal transform to take a stab at writing down a solution in the upper half point, or in, the, in this strip, this half strip. So if I took this problem, this boundary problem, and I mapped it to half strip, I get this. So the blue part was here. What was the boundary condition on the blue part? No heat flow, which were parallel, right? Or the insulated condition, which you can think of as the derivative in this direction is zero. du dn is zero all through here. So whatever the flow line is here, it has to be straight up and down is going to be the idea. Where do the other pieces go? Um, T is equal to zero is down here. T is equal to one was up here. And now we get to pull a fast one. Can we just guess a solution? Yeah. What is it? Straight vertical, straight line. vertical lines, right? It ha why does it have to be straight vertical lines? It's constantly zero at the bottom and constantly one at the top, and we have to be parallel here. So the most straightforward solution we can write down, seriously, I'll just drop it, I can't find one piece, would be to draw this and think, okay, probably what's happening is you get this really easy map where that describes the flow lines. And so you might see Okay, based on that, I'm going to write, I don't know what this function is necessarily, I mean I do, but um, I can guess what this one is, which is, so if this is i pi right here, I'm going to bet I could write down the function u is equal to 1 over pi times the y coordinate of whatever the point is. That 
that map represents these, uh, that sort of like description of how the temperature is going, right? You would say, oh, well, as I go from 0 to 1, I increase linearly in y as I do so. Essentially what you're saying is, okay, here's all the places where, this is, uh, I guess we're doing u's over here, not t's. This is where u is equal to 1 tenth, and then there's a line for u is equal to 1 quarter, and then there's a line for u is equal to a half. These are the lines of constant temperature. Nothing can pass through the boundary. This is what you would imagine is happening here, and you can verify that that function, certainly it's going to meet the boundary conditions. So U works at the boundary, I mean as Y goes to zero, U goes to zero everywhere, and as Y goes to I pi, um, uh, so Y is going from zero to pi, right? So as Y gets up to pi, then U turns into one, which is exactly what you want. Is it harmonic? <coughs> what function is it the real part of? Yeah. 1 over i pi z. That's a pretty easy function to be a real part of. z is an analytic function, so it's the real part of an analytic function, so it's harmonic. How am I going to get this solution, which describes the temperature in the half strip case, and push it over to the half disk case that I'm interested in? If only I had a conformal map that got me from one to the other. So where the, the, the question you have to ask is, which direction are we interested in? Where do I want the domain of my temperature map to be? Do I want these to be my real domain elements, or do I want these to be my real domain elements? These should be z values over here. And then I need to take those z values, and I need to put them inside of this half strip. So how do I do this? Log z. So if you write down the map, f cat is equal to 1 over i pi composed with log z. So that's, that map right there is 1 over i pi z composed with log z. So the conformal map and then our solution. That will be a complex potential for that case. This is a complex potential. over here. And so the real part of that function is our solution. And uh, not surprising that we keep seeing the same things over again. Um, it turns out to be the case that the actual function that falls out of this is, we already know that what's going to come out of this is going to be the argument. right? The real part of i pi log z, the i flips the argument to the real part, and you end up with t is equal to 1 over pi uh, times the arctangent, whatever it is. And that has precisely the behavior that we were interested in over here. It's the argument function. Yep. Is it u what? What's that? u is the real part. Uh, oh, u works at the boundary, sorry. u has the correct boundary. Because as you let y go to 0, u is equal to 0 constantly. And as you let y go to pi, you get 1 constantly on the other side. And that function turns out to have precisely this behavior. And now, like I said, there's an entire library of amusing functions that you can conformally transform significantly more complicated domains than half planes into things like half disks. So, uh, it turns out that one, I think one of the ones I'm going to ask you about temperature question in the homework will be a vertical half strip, in which case you have to use the sine function to take. Uh, and that's really weird to think about. So sine z will turn out to take vertical half strips to half disk <coughs> as well. Yep. It's sort of, you know, guess. Yeah. So, so essentially, yes, right? The geometric reasoning here is, if, I mean, where does, where does this guess come from? The guess comes from the fact that we know that, that that sort of orthogonal behavior is going to be preserved by the conformal maps. And so should, we should be looking to write a solution down that is the simplest version of 
preserving the sort of geometry that we want to preserve. Now, the one caveat I have to put on all of this is physical reality is more irritating than math. And so while this describes a way of getting here to here harmonically that is very that's naive and easy to understand, that real life scenarios usually involve quite a bit more that this might be a component of what's really going on. But there's other flows that you have to introduce and then super, and, you know, you do a superposition, right? Every harmonic flow that you get can be added to a previous flow and you retain a harmonic flow. And so, for example, I think we talked about an airflow, uh, like oh, airfoils, that there's actually three different flows that you need to put together to describe what's happening on a wing, plus some fudge factors, right? And so here, when you really get into the study of the physical interpretation of these things, the mathematics behind this works, but you actually might need to observe physical reality to guess what the actual flow is that you're interested in how temperature actually distributes itself. Okay, so that's it. That's kind of formal maps. Next time we'll talk about special functions. Thursday is a work day. Uh, and then, uh, yeah. Oh, wait. Okay.